phone right now. My brother, the baddest man in hip hop, D.A. Smart. Bring him on with a round of applause. In the name, in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, assalamu alaikum. I want to thank God for being in, for having me in Baltimore tonight. And I want to thank the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan for allowing me to be on the tour with him in the Mary's Mall movement. Being a positive brother on the scene for such a long time, he saw me and he said, brother, they ain't going to give it to you. So we have to give it to you. Yes. Yes, test, test, test. I ain't working. I got some pieces I want to do for my brothers and sisters. It's called Black People Ain't Prejudiced. We just mad. Because we are. <laughs> and the theme song for the Men's More Movement. And it goes like this. This is about D.A. Smart and his destiny. This is about what's deeply invested in me. This about what they kept as a mystery. What is it about, y'all? Black history. Back in the days when black men were slaves, we couldn't go off and rage because we was locked in chains. They constantly remind us without the boot, they put stuff on TV like roots. I'm sitting there watching them with my hand on the trigger. My anger is growing big as they call me nigger. They whipping me and whip me almost every day. Trying to change my name to Toby when it's Coot de Kinte. Then I look to my left and there stand my kid. So I scream my name Toby so then I can live. I can't take it no more so I shut off the TV. Now if a white man mess with me, he'll be six feet deep. That's my mentality brother for what they've done in the past. They got rid of us then and still trying to get rid of our men. Just to show so you can know that white people ain't it. Emmett Till got killed just from whistling at a white snitch. They killed blacks and whites without thinking. He so called free state, they shot the mess out of Lincoln. Yo, and he changed his ways. They killed Malcolm X. Two years down the line, Martin King was next. Uh, the struggle has started. It ain't near over yet. Now you should understand why. DA upset because they'll take all them bitches and say the white man made it. They know we got them faded. They got too much pride to stay there. I hate it. Like the chain us on a crowded boat. We peed and messed on each other. They laughed and made jokes. They took a black girl, hung her up on the cross. She was eight months pregnant. Her hope was lost. Arms spread and wide. They cut a baby from her stomach. It fell on the ground. They crushed it and stomped it. Now how in the heck you expect me to take this? The chains was just too heavy for my wrist. Now what have we done to accept this punishment? Living for thousands of years in bondage. They treat us like animals. They locked us in chains. Taught us to speak their language and then they changed our names. But what did we do when they came to our land? We welcomed them in as though they were some black men. They bribed our leaders with rum and gold. And with that bribe, black men were sold. So they bring us to America, treat us like rats. But when they were in Africa, was it like that? Nope, I figured it out. The whole meaning of prejudice, the meaning of the word is just plain jealous. They jealous of the fact that blacks was here first. See, the white man came when the black man was cursed. All whites are evil. I treat them politely, I just mistreat those. <laughs> that mistreat me, because they really think that whites are supreme, see? They don't feel we are equal human beings. Now that's the reason blacks think they're bad. Black people ain't prejudiced, we just mad. The leader said he wants you to do the second one after it's over. Yes, sir. Let's give it up for Brother D.A. Smart. Come on. Keep on your feet, brothers and sisters. Cause our man is here. He's not a robber. He's not a thief. We love the message and the messenger because he speaks for us. Let us receive at this moment the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Come on, Baltimore. Let's hear it. Hear ye. Amen.
In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, we thank Him and we praise Him for His guidance to the human family through His prophets and His messengers. We thank Him for Moses and the Torah or the Old Testament. We thank Him for Jesus and the Gospel and the New Testament. We thank Him for Muhammad and the Qur'an. Peace be upon these worthy servants of Allah. I am a student of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and I could never thank Allah enough for His intervention in our affairs in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, the great Mahdi or guide, who came among us to raise one from among us to guide us, the lost sheep, back into the fold of God. I thank Allah for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and I greet all of you, my dear brothers and sisters, with the greeting words of peace. We say it in the Arabic language, Assalamu alaikum. To my dear brother minister, Carlos Muhammad, members of the staff of Muhammad Mosque number six, members of the local organizing committee, to the grand master of this great lodge, to Dr. Reverend Dr. Wright, and to all of those who preceded me and to D.A. Smart, who has written something very beautiful for the Millions More Movement, and he will do that at the end of the program. My dear brothers and sisters, I, I come to you tonight and I want to speak to you from my heart to your hearts. We have entered a time of trouble. As the scripture says, like there never was a time since there was time and a nation. A time of trouble. We've always been in trouble. Why is this a time of trouble like there never has been since there was a time and a nation? It is because of the presence of God and his judgment on the world of the wicked and his judgment of the United States of America who represents the head of the wicked nations of the earth. I represent the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, a man whom God raised up to be a bearer of good news and a warner from himself to the government and people of America as well as to you and me. We as a people have not been aware of the time and what must be done in a time like this, a time of trouble. To my brothers and sisters who are pastors and preachers and teachers, you must be aware that this is the time of the judgment of this present world, particularly the United States of America. And when a country is being judged, God himself sends down his judgment, his decision. But he gives you time to catch up 
to the decision that he has rendered against the house that we live in. In the days of Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah, God told Abraham, go to Sodom. Your nephew is there. And tell him that uh, the angels of destruction are on their way to Sodom and Gomorrah because of the abominable behavior carried on in Sodom and Gomorrah. And the name Sodomy has come from that city. It's a twin city. So God told Abraham, I'm going to destroy everybody except Lot and his family. And Abraham, being the friend of God, questioned him. Would you destroy the righteous along with the wicked? Now he had already told Abraham his judgment. So Abraham should have said, okay God, I know you know better than I. But Abraham said, wait a minute. You're going to destroy the righteous along with the wicked? He said, well, Abraham, why don't you go down there? See if you can find 50 righteous, and I'll save the city. He came back and he said, uh, Lord, I couldn't find 50. He said, well, go back and see if you can find 40. Abraham came back and said he couldn't find 40. He said, well, try 30, then try 20, then try 10. And then Abraham nearly exasperated. He said, go back and find me one other than what I said. And Abraham came back and said, I couldn't find one. So the book says, on that very day, fire and brimstone fell on Sodom and Gomorrah. And then the scripture says, as it was in the days of Noah and in the days of Lot, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. People were partying in that day. They were giving in marriage. They were dancing. They, they were having a good time, man, when the flood came. And in Sodom, they were carrying on their sodomy when the end came. Now we're at a time that America must reap what she has sown. And the mercy of God extended to America and to you and me is just about over. When God gives his pronouncement, he gives a time for people to repent. And there's no sense in repenting after the destruction starts coming, it's a little late. In the days of Noah, when the cloud was forming, people didn't pay no attention to it. But when it rained one day, two days, three days and nights, four days, then the people remembered what Noah was saying. They ran to the door to knock, but it was a little too late. That's the condition that America is in, the world is in, and we are in. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad told us 
that our sojourn in America was in fulfillment of divine prophecy. Now, there's no sense, pastors, in preaching about the greatness of Jesus and not tying things to the utterances of the prophet and how the prophet's utterances fit the world condition today. We always talk about what happened back then. People go to church and get put in a time machine. It's all right, it's all right to know what happened back then only if it's going to give you an indication so you can understand what's happening right now. You are in the church of what's happening now. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, we are in the Bible from Genesis to Revelations. America is in the Bible. It's not under the name America, but it's there. How could a country be as great and powerful as this nation is and the prophets who could see didn't see America? How could a whole nation of people enslaved by another be in prophecy and the prophets didn't see it or exist and the prophets that they saw right to the end but didn't see Negroes? Well, if they saw us, under what name did the prophets see us? Under what name did the prophets see America? And where are we now in the time of the judgment? The question is why are millions more movement? I'm gonna get to that. But I have to lay this because of what's happening in New Orleans. I really want everybody to understand what's going down. Well, where are we in prophecy? From Genesis to Revelations. In the 15th chapter of Genesis, around the 13th, 14th and 15th verses, God is talking to Abraham and he's saying to Abraham, know of a surety that your seed will be a stranger in a land that is not theirs. And they shall serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years. But after that time, I will come That's right. and I will judge that nation which they shall serve That's right. That's right. and afterwards shall they come out with great substance and go to their fathers in peace and be buried in a good old age. Now, many of the Jewish people feel that they fulfilled this in their sojourn in Egypt when Moses was sent to them to remove them from the bondage of Pharaoh. But then in Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter around the 18th verse, God is now talking to Moses. And these are the words. And I will, future tense, raise them up a prophet like unto you, Moses. And I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Well, then the children of Israel are out of that because Moses fixed that one. But then 
the Bible says, I'm going to raise them up, a future people. A prophet from among their brethren, like unto you, Moses. Well, nobody in history fulfills that prophecy in modern times, but you and me and the government of America, white people and their children. Now just listen, cause uh, don't need to get yourself too hot clapping. <laughs> just let me see the burning up of the cells of your brain thinking. Now, family look. Most black leaders say we were in chattel slavery 250 some odd years. Era. There's 64 years of hidden history that turned a black man into a Negro and a black woman into a destroyed creature. That's why the white man uses the number 64 for the $64 question or the $64,000 question. We never asked him, why 64? He knows, but he's not going to tell you. So I'm going to tell you what I was taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Now, he said, and you can check it out in your libraries, that the first slaves did not come in 1619, but in 1555. On a ship named Jesus. The first slaves that were brought here were not no jungle bunnies. All right, all right. They were the kind of slaves wise in science and mathematics, such as were builders of civilization. See, I'm in the large. That's right. And I want to talk to the large because I want you with me at the Millions More Movement, the 10th anniversary celebration of the Million Man March and it won't be successful without Baltimore. It won't be successful unless Baltimore turns out as Baltimore should and I want to talk to you about why you should. But family, in the book of Daniel, it talks about some gold and silver vessels that were in the temple at Jerusalem. And they were taken out of the temple and brought into Babylon and spoiled with wine and strong drink. Daniel also talks about the Hebrew boys. Daniel, Azariah, Hananiah, and another one whose name I miss, not Zephaniah, something like that, I don't know. But when they got to Babylon, the Babylonian king changed their name, their tongue, and their learning, and made them to eat of the king's meat something that they never ate when they were at home in the Holy Land among the holy people. Their name was changed to Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro. I mean, oh, oh bad Negro. Now, 
if the seed of Abraham is going to receive a prophet the like of Moses, then if you look at the Jesus of 2,000 years ago and the prophet Muhammad of 1,400 years ago, there is some similarity, but side angle side don't equal side angle side. So there's not congruence there. What I'm saying is, the Jews were not in a strange land. They were in their own land. The Arabs were not in a strange land under a wicked king like Pharaoh. They were in Arabia in their own land and they were under the rule of ignorance, not some superpower overpowering them. God raised Jesus and God raised Muhammad gave them scripture, but they did not fulfill. A man like Moses, even though Prophet Muhammad brought a law in the Quran, and Jesus spoke of the highest manifestation of law, and said to the Jews that were against him, I didn't come to change the law, I came to fulfill what was written in the law. Ah, this is stuff that as it begins to unfold, you see how magnificent the Bible is. If it's taught properly and understood properly, it is a road map for salvation for the people of God. Now I want you to follow this because I'm gonna move very quickly. Here we are, 450 years in America. From 1555 to 1955, 400 years. From 1955 to 2005 is 50 more years. And in this country, we have been afflicted every day, every week, every month, every year of our sojourn in America. Right? Every leader that stood up for us they either killed them, imprisoned them, deported them, got rid of them, so that nobody could change the condition that white folks put us in. So you are not now any different than the way the slave master fixed us 400 years ago because during that 64 years of hidden history he was breaking us robbing us of a name a language a culture a history a religion a god a country and the memory of what our fathers built in contributing to the march of civilization. So in the large, you understand that the master builder was hit. Where? By some ruffians and brought on a westerly course and buried in the north country in a shallow grave. But he was a master architect 
The National Director of the Million More Movement is in the house, the Reverend Dr. Willie Wilson. Now the brother got hit in the head and that hit in the head left him in a grave and nobody could raise him but the one who had the master grip. The master grip is called the lion's paw. The Bible says there's a lion asleep in Judah who will wake him. A sprig of Cassius came up out of the grave to show that even though he appeared dead, with the right grip, the dead man would come again to life. In the Virginia House of Delegates, in a book called Brown Americans by Mr. R. Embry, he writes that in the Virginia House of Delegates, a white man was saying, and it is recorded, that we have closed every avenue by which light can enter the slave's mind. Now you think about that one. And then he said, if they could ensure that no light would ever enter the slave's mind, he would be perpetually a slave, not only in that generation, but all the generations of white people in the future would have black people as their slaves. The Bible says the people walked in darkness, gross darkness, the people. But then it says, upon them hath the light shined. So it is already written that though they did this horrible thing to black people, light was going to come to the slave. But when they would see light coming, and that's what they saw in Denmark Vesey, that's what they saw in Nat Turner, that's what they saw in David Walker, that's what they saw in Frederick Douglass, that's what they saw in Sojourner Truth, that's what they saw in Harriet Tubman, that's what they saw in Booker T, that's what they saw in Malcolm X and Martin King and Kwame Touré. They saw somebody talking that if you listened, you might overcome yes, the evil of 400 years of slavery. 310 years of chattel slavery. Do you know what that is, brothers and sisters? That means that you and I were branded like they brand horses, cows, you and I were sold as a commodity for 310 years. We were bred. Males was the stud horse. Women had no rights over their bodies. So men would come and make you pregnant and they didn't have to support what they made because you were eating crude food, living in a crude house, wearing crude clothes, and everybody had a job. In those days, it was full employment because all of us were slaves. Sometimes I feel, the song says, like a motherless child, a long ways from home. Mother gone, father gone, a motherless child sees a hard time. 
summertime and the living is easy. Fish are jumping and the cotton is high. Black people, we caught hell under them. They broke us. Yes, sir. They reversed the course of nature with us. The African man always was the head of his house. And the African woman could depend on the African man to provide her and the children with maintenance as well as guidance so she could look up to him and honor him and respect him. And so she did not mind giving him the best of herself to console him and comfort him. She did not mind having his children for him because she knew he was a good man and he would take care of them. But the master knew that after he broke us as a man, he would reverse it so that the woman would no longer depend on the man she would depend on herself and the white man. And then she, after being broken, would make her daughters like her, independent. And her sons would be broken by her so that when they reached 16, she could give them to the master that he could work them in any way he desired. Now look at you, sisters. Your natural love and desire to protect what you bring in the world cause you to break your male children. Those of us who grew up in the South, in the harsh days of lynching and Jim Crow, when the boy child came into the world, mama was nervous. And she would tell her male children, now listen, son, when a white man comes down the street, you don't, you don't stay on the sidewalk, you get off in the street. And for God's sake, if you see that fountain and it says white, don't you drink from that fountain. You go to a fountain that says colored, then you drink. Don't go in the white bathroom now because they'll kill you, son. So when you put that in your children, you break in them and you're making them afraid. So the black woman has a lot more courage than the black man. And she's a lot more out front than the black man. And in your present condition and in our condition, you say from your lips, I don't need a man for nothing. We have hurt you just that much that you are saying, I don't need him for nothing. The enemy is selling these little toys in the adult store. And uh, did. Did I, did I say something wrong? Or, or did I hit a nerve? Or? And with these little toys, we are really obsolete. But we can't give her nothing else. She got, got her own apartment. You married a woman, she got her own apartment. She got all her dishes. She has a child from a former marriage, so you can't give her that. She's driving a car, may have a home, and here you come. Hey, hey, baby. How you doing, girl? Let's get it on. And she looks at you in the toy. Sometimes she chooses you 
and then goes back to the toy. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm going to get off that subject right away. This is not to embarrass anybody, but it's to state a condition started in slavery that we have not overcome. As men, we have to reverse this, but we need a teacher to help us get out of what the enemy put us in. The only way we can get out of it is God has to acquaint us with himself and the nature of God that's in us. And if we rise to become reflections of God, she falls right in place. And she doesn't mind being a comfort, a consoler to give us peace and quiet of mind. But today, she's very, 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 very disappointed, very, very, very hurt, and she appears like she's being a lesbian. No, 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 I said she appears that way. She would rather be with a woman that understands her pain than to be with a man to increase her pain. And most young women that are engaged with women, they've been hurt in their life by a man. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us that there's no such thing as a no good woman. Every woman that you see that's no good was made no good by a no good man. I don't want to get away from my subject matter, but many of the ladies, the sisters in this room have been abused from young girls by a father. I want to stop there for a minute because the father is the first man in the daughter's life. And the father is looked up to by the daughter as an object of love and honor. And when a father would take advantage of the pure expression of love from a daughter and then have sex with her, he kills something in her for men. Because even if she marries, she's a wounded soul who cannot give completely to the man that she marries because of the effect of a father that she trusted, an uncle that she trusted, a grandfather that she trusted, a cousin, a brother, and even a friend of the family that while he was visiting the family, he was scoping the daughter. Now you sisters in this audience, you know what I'm talking about. Do you? Yes, sir. I don't think I heard you. Yes, sir. And our women are wounded, and so are our men. Now the enemy, knew what he was doing. And after slavery was so-called over, which it never was, this man promised us 
40 acres and a mule because when you got a slave that you've broken and made him dependent on massa and then you cut him loose, he has to be taught now how to go for himself. He has to be shown now how to do for himself. But we were never shown. So we had to turn right back around and go to the master and ask him to keep us on the plantation. So many of us grew up in the South as sharecroppers living on the plantation of our former slave master and we would work and go to the company store which was the same slave master and we would owe him and when it was time for him to give us the little that we were given, we would still owe. And whether you know it or not, in Louisiana right now, there are brothers and sisters who are yet in slavery. Yes, right now. Hard for you to believe, isn't it? It's real. So let me move quickly. The book says, after we have served that 400 years, God would come. Now, people say, well, why does God have to come when he's everywhere? At all times, he's omnipresent. All that's true. But God was going to visit the land of bondage to raise up the new Moses just like he raised up the old one. And in that a Bible, it said Moses spoke to God face to face as a man speaketh to his friend. Okay. So where's that land that he's going to visit? It's the new land of bondage. It's the United States of America. Now follow prophecy. Matthew 24. As lightning shines from the east, even unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be, that wheresoever the eagles are gathered together, there shall the carcass be. The symbol of America is a great eagle, and we are the remains of a once Great people, but now it's a carcass. Ezekiel in the 37th chapter sees us as the dry bones in the valley. All divided, all dry. Heard many good words, but won't come together and won't stand up. So the son of man that was raised from the valley... There's a son of man coming out of the east, but there's another one raised out of the valley of bones, and that son of man was sent to the bones to talk to the bones. And the bones heard him, but the bones wouldn't come together. So he went back to the Lord and said, Lord, I have spoken to them. They have heard your word, but they have not come together. So the Lord said, Son of man, don't worry. Go back and prophesy unto the winds and let the winds blow on these slain of God. In the book of Revelations, it says, hold back the four winds till I go down and seal my elect in their forehead with the seal of the living God. Jesus was a man of parables. Yes, sir. And he gave a parable when somebody asked him, he gave the first commandment. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. And then... A smart dude in the audience said, and who is my neighbor? Uh -huh. And Jesus gave him a parable. 
a man was going from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among thieves that hit him in his head. Brothers, I hope that you're going because you have another appointment because you're going to miss something. But I hope you get the tape and hear it because your life depends on it. And I say this, you know, the Bible talks about a time when we would heap to ourselves teachers that would tickle our ears and we would hate the preaching of a good word. I hope that's not talking about you, but if it is, something is coming that will help you to hear. In fact, it's already here. Now, when Jesus said the boy went from Jerusalem to Jericho, he said he went down. I think he said, I will go down. The cry in the time of Moses, God says, I think I will go down to see if the cry is all together that I have heard. The man was going from Jerusalem to Jericho and he went down to yes, Jerusalem, sir. I mean to Jericho. So here comes the son of man out of the east. He's coming down. because he's going to a graveyard to raise up a dead people. Now, if the man like Moses says to you, look, this is your enemy and God does not want you to integrate with your enemy because he's come to punish your enemy and to free you from your enemy and give you a land flowing with milk and honey. Martin King, just before he died, he said, I've been to the mountaintop. I ain't worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. I've been to the mountaintop. I looked over. I have seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but we as a people will get to the promised land. Not promised sky. Don't let nobody tell you that there's something up in the sky waiting for you. Ain't nothing up there. They got a Hubble telescope that white folks made. And they looking and finding stars and even new planets. They ain't see the golden streets of heaven yet. Cause gold comes from the earth. And if there's a golden street, it have to be made on the earth. And if you believe in Jesus and he taught you how to pray, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom, thy will be. Where? Where? But what are you worried about democracy for? If you are serious about your prayer, then you are looking for God to establish his kingdom. And when he comes to establish his kingdom, Bush got to sit down. All the rulers of the world got to sit down. All right, now, let's tie this up. God came to save us. That's the good news. The good news of the gospel is 
that God would choose a people that were no people at all. He would be their God and they would be his people and the last would be first. The bottom rail would come to the top and that that was the tail would now be the head and this is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our sight. The white people know that you are the one that is to fulfill this prophecy. Now listen to me carefully now, because this is the way the trick is coming down on you. He already knows this. Now I'm gonna go to Jesus for a minute and Calvary, because I want you to see your relationship to the story. Lazarus was a great friend of Jesus. And uh, somebody came and told him, look, your friend uh, Lazarus is dead. And Jesus said, no, no, he just sleeps. And say, well, take me where he is. So Martha took him and Jesus had been dead, they say, four days and stinking. Four days here represent 400 years. See, you've been in your grave 400 years and your condition makes you stink in the nostrils of civilized people, man. People come in the neighborhood and see you and they revulsed by what they see because your condition in comparison to what you were when you were up, you were nothing in comparison to what, wait a minute to what you were and your condition makes you stink in the nostrils of people who love each other, people who respect each other, people who are building something. When they look at you, they wonder, what in the hell is wrong with them? I'm Korean, the man said. And I can go in the Negro neighborhood and offer them hair. Nails. And they buy that stuff from me. My Chinese brother, he come and get them chow mein, egg foo young. The Arab come in and offer you whatever you want. Everybody making money offer you and looking at you with a crazy eye because this is not natural for a people to never produce nothing of what they consume and others are producing it for you and me. Everybody knows you are dead. And that's why you don't get respect from the Koreans. You don't get respect from the Arabs. You don't get respect from the Chinese. You don't get respect from white people. Because you're not doing that that earns you respect. Well, wait a minute, man. Wait, 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 wait a minute. I'm a great ball player. Yes, you are, brother. Can't nobody shoot it like you. But hell, they train dogs with their nose to put the ball in the hoop. So you get millions of dollars to put a ball in the hoop, but then the question is asked, what are you doing with your money? You can rap and call your woman a bitch or call your woman a whore and talk about how you busted a cap in somebody's butt. That, that's your language. And, and they give you money for that but then you bling blinging because you don't know what to do to make money make money. So you still are unproductive. And there are people that want you to stay that way so they can continue to take your money. Now, in China, years ago, the Chinese had a lot of silver. 
And America and England wanted the silver out of China, so they introduced opium to the Chinese people. And as the Chinese people began to smoke the opium, the silver started leaving China, coming to America and Great Britain. I'm giving you a picture. Reagan was fighting a war against the Sandinista regime in Nicaragua. And the Congress would not give Reagan money to fight that war. So he had to find new ways to bring money to America so that they could buy weapons and send the weapons down to the Contras who were fighting against the so-called communists. So then drugs start flowing in from Colombia, from Bolivia, El Salvador, Jamaica. They had a, tra a, a, a trail for the drugs to come in. The drugs coming into a consumer nation That's right. that are so much in pain, the drug gives them a high, gives them some sense of self, some joy. So let's kill two birds with one stone. We'll knock the Negroes out with the drug, take the money, send it to drive the communists out of Central America, then we build new prisons because we're going to change drug laws or put drug laws in that if these Negroes who cannot afford powdered cocaine would be caught with a few rocks, then we're going to give them five years straight. And if they're with a weapon, we're going to add more time, so they're going to start with 7 to 10 or 10 to 15. Then we're going to get them in prison and experiment with them. Young boys with fat behinds, we gang rape them. And experiment with them and give them the AIDS virus. Then when they come out of prison to the girlfriend that they left behind, they really want to have sex, but they're confused now about who they are yeah. because they were somebody's bitch in prison. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. These brothers don't want to be homosexuals. But their behind look like a tunnel now. So they come out and they with you at night and on the down low in the day. And they filling you with an AIDS virus. And now the black woman is the number one carrier of HIV AIDS. How did all this happen to you? Factories leaving the inner cities, going to cheap labor markets. What is the percentage of unemployed in Baltimore? Talk to me, somebody. Come on, doctor, you got it. You got it. Down near 50 percent. Unemployed. Well, how then can you sustain a family? You don't have no money. There's no job for you. You dropped out of high school. Maybe didn't even go to high school. So what's happening to you? You're being herded like sheep, either into the armed forces so they can send you to die for them in Iraq and Afghanistan, or they're sending you to jail because you the biggest dope dealer in the community with your gun and your territory. Now you're killing one another wholesale. The white man doesn't have any more use for you. So he's making very sharp moves to get rid of us as a people. 
and God is watching. Now I come to the end of my time. Reagan, I'm sorry, Bush, started a war in Iraq. President Bush said they had weapons of mass destruction. He used Colin Powell, sent him before the United Nations to lie to the American people and use the sincerity of the man to get over a lie. Now it's coming out in which if you read my letter to Bush back in 2001, I already told him before the war began what was in his mind and what the consequences would be if he went to war. Go get my letter off the, U, uh, off the uh, internet and see what your brother told your president. I am an extension of that man, Elijah Muhammad. And I am a warner and a bearer of good news. You can take it or you can let it alone. But every word that I speak, you're going to face it. I warned that man. I said, I know what's in your mind. Because it was already revealed to me. And he paid no attention to what I told him would happen. In a second letter I wrote him, I said, every American soldier that dies, their bodies would be laid at your doorstep. And now Cindy Sheehan is asking him, why did my son have to die on the basis of a lie? Now, family, I remember Rumsfeld and Cheney when the bombs fell in Iraq and the newspaper the next day showed fire coming up from the ground and the headline was shock and awe. They were so proud of their ability to destroy another man's house, destroy another man's ability to give water to the people, destroy another man's ability to turn on the lights in the country, poison the water and the ground with dirty bombs filled with depleted uranium. But the master teacher Jesus said, whatsoever a man soweth, the same shall he also reap. Well, if you know, and most black people were not with this war, not that we're not patriotic, we just wasn't with the war. Because we knew something was wrong with the picture that they were painting. You know how it is when white folks shoot you down in the street, unjustified, then put a gun near your body and say he had a weapon. And then they call it justifiable homicide. He had to justify what he wanted to do to Saddam Hussein and Iraq by putting up all these lies about weapons of mass destruction. Okay, okay. After 9-11, Patriot Act passed in Congress, 
half the Congress didn't even read it. <laughs> Giving up the liberties that they had that we understood we didn't have, but now they're taking away these liberties from white people and using it as an excuse to further take away ours. Then rape the treasuries, $340 billion spent on the war in Iraq. Three months ago, I went to California to visit Stan Tukey Williams, one of the co-founders of the Crips, who was at San Quentin. And then I had a gang intervention meeting with the Bloods and the Crips and the Mexican gang leaders because the blacks and the Mexicans are killing each other on the West Coast. The enemy putting us against each other so he can continue to rule at our expense. Now follow this, brothers and sisters. There are two warnings that I gave. I said to America, as you have done to the cities of nations of the world, I said, God is going to take one of your cities and destroy it completely to show you, to show you that you have no power against God. But then there was a warning to you, to you. See, you've been sitting on the fence. Every black leader that ever came, the majority of us sat on the fence. We watched Booker T. Washington. We didn't join him. We heard Marcus Garvey. We didn't join him. When they took W.E.B. Du Bois's passport and wouldn't let him travel, we knew it. When Paul Robeson stood for us, fought for us, a great mind, and they called him a communist, it was we who stoned him upstate New York. Martin King came and called us to action, and we watched him. Malcolm X stood, and many of us, they got pictures of Brother Malcolm on our wall. When, you, when he was alive, you were scared to death to get around him. How do I know? Because you're scared to death to get around me today. Some of you are waiting for the white man to kill me so that maybe you could put my picture up and name an alley after me and talk about fair conduct with my man. I used to go out and see that cat. That cat really laid it down, yeah? But damn it, if you don't pick up what I'm laying down, your ass is gonna lay down eternally. Ain't going to be no middle of the road niggas and negroes today. You're going to get off the fence because you're neither hot nor cold, but you're going to be hot or you're going to be cold. You're going to make a choice today, but whatever choice you make, you better be prepared to suffer the consequences because death has now entered into America. Yes, sir. I want you to hear me now. Three months ago, I told them God was going to destroy one of your major cities. I didn't know which one it was. I just knew it was going to happen. And I spoke it. And then in talking to my brother, Bloods and Crips, and to the gangbangers in Baltimore and in New York and Chicago, wherever you are, you're killing the people that God came to save. You have no love for yourself and no love for your brother. 
and you can smoke him and go home and eat and you don't feel nothing. So you all are now becoming your enemy. And the God, after we have taught you, Malcolm taught you, in this city, you had great ministers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Isaiah Kareem was here. For those of you that are my age or more, Louis Omar, others, Clyde Rockman, they all taught you. Then you got preachers here that teach you good. But you ain't got an ear. And like the Bible says, man, I piped to you all the day long. And you have not danced. And I have mourned to you. And you have not lamented. So what does this mean to God? You hate the truth or you don't love it enough to act on it and so the black people of America are headed into the chastisement of God. New Orleans is the murder capital of black America today. And I told my brothers in California that God is going to kill you. Since you love the shedding of blood, he's going to give you your own blood to drink. And the Bible says that those who rejected Moses and Aaron, he sent fiery serpents after them. Serpent here means Caucasians who are angry. Today in the newspaper, the governor of Louisiana said they had 300 National Guards that are there with orders to shoot, to kill, and they're bringing back soldiers from Iraq that are battle-hardened and know how to kill, and they're sending them into Louisiana. Now watch this. We have been taught, thou shalt not steal. But hell, when the first law of, uh, of uh, uh, is self-preservation, then all the laws are off when it comes to a man who's hungry. He break into a store to steal some milk, steal some bread, steal some meat. What the hell are you breaking in a store to steal a television for? And there's no electricity. And can't nobody buy the damn thing. They're trying to get out of town and you walking with a television. You just a jackass, people. Now some of you got your little pop guns. It's one thing to be hungry, That's right. but then to start raping women. So now, within a few days, they might cut loose. And although there are thousands of bodies dead and maybe thousands more undiscovered in the rubbish, there may be others that will die from gunshot wounds and the worst is yet to come. President Bush and FEMA and the federal government should be ashamed of themselves. Listen, listen, listen. That hurricane hit Florida as a one did its damage, and went out in the Gulf. 
Then it started coming up the Gulf, picking up water from the warm waters of the Gulf, and the numbers started going up, and the, and the winds started getting harsher and harder. It went from one to two to three, and then it stopped for a while. Now, when they saw that hurricane picking up that kind of speed, the winds getting to a three and a four, the Federal Emergency Management Agency and the government should have started sending trucks and buses and hospital ships because the weatherman said it was heading straight for New Orleans. And they did not do anything when it got to four and the winds had picked up to 185, uh, uh, five rather, and the winds had picked up to 185, going near 200 miles an hour and it had not hit land yet, and they said in so many hours it was gonna hit land and nothing was on the way. Nothing. They waited until it struck, and even though it veered off northeast and the eye did not pass over New Orleans, yet there was enough water to bust the levee, a levee that they knew was not sufficient for a number five hurricane. And they had been begging Washington for money to raise the levee even higher to protect New Orleans, which sits in a bowl under sea level. So when the levee busted, the water came. I saw them standing in the French Quarter, Bourbon Street, the funky street. I saw them standing downtown. It was dry then. And then, and then the unthinkable happened. The levee broke and the water started coming downtown. The water started coming over to where white folks was. So some are saying that they didn't respond because the early cry was the cry of black people. Some say they, black folks started shooting at the helicopters because the helicopters wouldn't stop and pick them up. Although a lot of the pictures that we saw, they were being, black folk were being picked up. I got a call today from someone that's on the ground in a film crew. He said, everything that you see on television, multiply it 10 times because it's 10 times as bad as what you see. Now listen to what my teacher said. He said there would be unusual rain. And he talked about how the water and the floods would begin tearing up the roads, the streets, the highways, and compromise the foundation of the houses. And the snakes would bring be brought out of their hiding places. Today we learn, or yesterday we learned that the snakes were in the water. Alligators in the water from the marshlands. And who is suffering? Us. Now you you believe that this is an act of God, don't you? Yes. And you ought to ask yourself, 
Why is God angry? See, most of us play with God. Even us as teachers and preachers. We play with his name. We play with him. And we preach like, like we believe. Even some of my ministers. When we saw what was happening in New Orleans, some of my ministers went into shock, panic. The hell you in panic for when you've been hearing this so long? Or did you think that this was a lie? Now there ain't no more hiding place. That's the first city to go. But many more going down behind it. And the question is on you now. Because I've done my job. And one of you say that Farrakhan, if you heard me, didn't warn you. The chastisement of God is inside America. And blood is going to be up to the horse's bridle. And it will be your blood and the blood of your enemies. Since you don't want to leave your enemies and are in love with your enemy after the enemy is telling you he don't love you, he don't give a damn about you, but you still want to stay with him and suck up to him and try to befriend him while you're killing yourself and your own people. Your time has come. If I never talk to you again in life, America is going down. And many of you or us are going down with him. He wants to integrate you, to take you down so that your future that is prophesied that you would never receive it. He knows your future. So he offer you a white woman to keep you fascinated. Now you can walk the street with her. Samson and Delilah. Yeah, you in bad shape, brother. You ain't far behind, sister. Just look at your condition, sister. You think God is pleased with you? You've lost all shyness, all shame, and your morality is gone. You open your knees almost to any man who wants to enter you. What the hell, it's only sex? Is that all it is? Look at what you've become. There was a time the elders in this room know that your underwear would not be on a line in your own house so your own son could see your drawers. let alone being on a line outside for your neighbor to see. Now you don't care. You put on clothes, your drawers is out there. The white man keeps making the clothes less and less and less, and you don't mind you taking yours off, putting on less and less and less, and wonder why men don't have no more respect for you. <laughs> Sister, come in the church, Reverend, yes, sir. Talk to me, God. with a miniskirt on, you yes, trying sir. to preach. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. And you spy in heaven and don't know how to preach after that. You sisters, 
You know how fine you are. You know a man can't look at your nakedness and have the same thought in his mind. Come on now. You know this. Protecting yourself is protecting him from himself. Because he is so sexually oriented today. And you know it. You go out to the disco or wherever you go in the party. You make sure something is showing. You checked it in the mirror and You knew Bootylicious was out there. And you wanted to outdo the girl next door because hers was sort of tight, but you made yours super tight. And then you could see through it and see you had a thong on. Why, I was turning my television dial the other day and I happened to hit BET. <laughs> and there was a sister with her back to the uh, screen and a thong on. <laughs> and my hand froze. I couldn't turn. I was trying to be holy. But that woman was doing something with her gluteus maximus that I had never seen in my life. And holy was frozen. Well, I just got to be truthful, sisters. I don't care if you're a prophet. You could be a saint. But with bootylicious in your face, down go the Bible. Down go the Holy Quran. Ain't even time to pray. That's the power that a woman has. And that's why the Honorable Elijah Muhammad asked the sisters to cover yourself because the beauty of your body is not for the eyes of everybody. That's for the eye of that special man who has earned the right to see. Has earned the right to touch. Every man in the neighborhood have not earned that right. You ought to make a man earn his place with you. Don't throw yourself away. So my sisters and my brothers, we're in trouble. And it is a time of trouble like there never was since there was a nation and a time. And God's judgment is on America. I wanted Bush, the president, to see the destruction, the shock and the awe of what God can do. Now pestilence is going to follow because the water supply is corrupted and diseased now with the corpses floating in the rivers and they can't get to the corpses and they said it would take nearly three months for the water to be pumped out of. 
God help us if we have a heavy rain and more thunderstorms. It's bad news. So now I'm saying to the millions more movement, our people are suffering. We don't know what the Red Cross is going to do and all those charities that money is coming to them. We don't know. Because if they do what they've been doing, we'll still be the last one to get anything. However, I think that's why a millions more movement is necessary. Right. See, if all black organizations and leaders are together, that's right. That's right. Go ahead, sir. then we can that's right. raise money. Yes, sir. We, can. we can call our black brother Nagan, who's the mayor of uh, New Orleans. What do you need? And we start pooling some money. And if he needs 500 buses, we send him 500 because the money is among us to do that. All we want to know is what to do, how to do it, and then get it to the people that need it most. I talked to my minister who is over the southwest region. He called me and said, Minister, he didn't talk directly to me, he talked to my son, send $50,000 down right away. <clears throat> He's in Houston, <clears throat> and the people that are evacuees have come out of New Orleans, and they took them to Houston, and he wanted to go <clears throat> and help feed the people of Houston. I said, and, and what kind of leader are you, brother? I have 50000 to send to you. I said, but 50000 is right at your feet. Why are you going to come to me first when you a leader and all these people are there? I said, go gather the preachers. Go gather the politicians. <clears throat> go gather the leaders of Houston and ask them to help look after our brothers and sisters. Steve, uh, Steve Harvey called me today. And he said, Farrakhan, we need to do something. I said, yeah, we do. But we need to know what to do. Talk to the mayor. So a call was put in to the mayor. The mayor's out with Bush, but I'm sure he'll get back to us sometime tonight. But then we gather our entertainers. We gather our people with money. And then we direct our aid directly, directly to our suffering people. And then I said this. I said, brother, I want you to get back to me and tell me what you think. Because Prophet Muhammad said, if you have a bowl of soup and your brother has none, half of your bowl belongs to your brother. I said, why don't you all gather the Muslims, gather the Christians, gather the brothers and sisters that have shelter, and go on down to where our people are in stadiums, and each family, take a family, and open your door to one that you call a stranger, and let them stay in your house and share your food with them. Show the world that you really love your people. Well, hell, I don't, I don't know. I don't know them niggas. I don't know really them niggas. Niggas ain't had a bath in the street. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Well, then, you really don't love your people. Open the door. Put them niggas come in my house, steal everything I got. And what is it that you got? Open your door and let your brother and your sister in and then tell them the rules of your house and tell them that they're welcome 
They don't have no clothes. They left with what they had on their back. Do you have something in your closet that you could share? Is there a bowl of soup that you can sit them around the table and pray together and have a bowl of soup together? Do you know what they will think about black people if we did that? It's the same thing that we thought at the Million Man March when all those brothers showed up from everywhere and all of a sudden you found love and brotherhood and you went away saying good things about yourself and your people. Open your doors and let them in. Would you do it, Farrakhan? Oh, yeah. I'm not going to tell you to do something that I wouldn't do. It's a great chance for me to bring them in the house and teach them. Feed them, bed them down, teach them. But hell, you know, man, your family come to stay three days. Shoot, after that, you're going to kick their behind out. You don't know how long they're going to be there. Well, you don't know. But if you did what a good brother would do, then it don't make no difference how long. Because then soon, if they have nothing to go back to, they will thank you. They'll get up out of your house, find a job, and get their own apartment, but they'll always remember your kindness. So I'm going to close with these words. The disciples asked Jesus, Master, when were you hungry and we fed you not? When were you naked and we clothed you not? When were you out of doors and we gave you not shelter? When were you sick and imprisoned and we ministered not unto you? And Jesus said, Inasmuch as you have not done these things unto the least of these, my brethren, you have not done it also unto me. Even though it's a tragedy, it's an opportunity to show that the message of Jesus Christ and the love of the Master is in our hearts. Now, if I came to your door, Farrakhan knocked on your door and you looked out, my man! Come on in, man. What's wrong? Is everything all right? What you doing in my house? And if I told you that my car stopped down the road and I ran out of gas, would you mind if I stopped by for a while? You'd say, no, brother, come on in. You know he's a man of wisdom, so you can't wait to sit him down and give him a bowl of something <laughs> and start asking him questions but you would do that to Jesse Jackson if he showed up or Al Sharpton because these are big shots but it's the little shot now that that needs a place and that's why Jesus said if you have not done it unto the least of these my brethren you have not done it also unto me. Brothers and sisters, you have to change. You have to do better by yourself. You have to clean up your life so that the chastisement of God 
like the angel of death coming, you had to have an X on your door in the blood of a lamb. And then the death angel passed over. It's in our hands. Let's make that covenant with God. Look at the words. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive all our sins, and heal our land. Our land needs a healing, and so do we. But the burden is on us to humble ourselves and pray. To the Muslims in the Quran, it says, whenever God sends a messenger, he seizes the people with distress and affliction that they might humble themselves. Distress and affliction is in the door. Come on. Let's bow before we are forced. For the scripture does say, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. So let's go home tonight. Look at your wife. Look at your family. If you're away from your wife, think about her. Think about your little children. And think about those children in New Orleans, a mother today carrying two little babies. And they were almost falling out of her arms. She was nursing them, but she was dehydrated and there was no more milk in her breast, and she had no milk to give her children. She's just walking and dying, and her children dying. And the general saw her and took the babies from her arms and gave it to a soldier and took her, and they put her in a helicopter, and they flew her immediately so she could get attention. Look at your children tonight and think about what we would feel if we were in the condition of our brothers and sisters in New Orleans and think about them and try to feel their pain. If you can feel their pain, you are alive and connected. If you can't feel the suffering of your people, and do something about it, then when suffering comes to your door, you'll know how to feel it then. Let's ask God to spare them any more pain. And let's tell him that we've seen enough and we really don't wish to see any more of this horror But this is also directed to the president. They're planning to bomb Iran now. And I want him to know that the Quran says that God would curtail America on her sides and push America in from the East Coast, from the West Coast, and from the South. It's happening. The beaches are being eroded. The people that build their homes on the beaches, they're washing them away. They're coming down off the mountains. God is at work on this country, and it's going to get worse and worse and worse. I pray for all of us. My time among you is short. <clears throat> I don't think it's death. But I told you all of an experience that I had 
that gave me the vision that allowed me to see not only Reagan, but Bush, Clinton, and Bush the second. And many of the people mocked me when I told them what I was shown on a wheel-like plane that I was taken up on in more than a vision-like experience. And I was told what Reagan was planning and that I should hold a press conference and make the world know what he was planning and tell them that I got it from Elijah Muhammad on the wheel. Listen, America has lied to the American people and has not admitted that that plane exists with 1,500 little bombing planes in it that are made like a wheel. Ezekiel saw this wheel and it had eyes all around, which means human beings are in it. It's here for two reasons. The destruction of America and on it is a brand new civilization. And when you look up and it said, I saw a new Jerusalem come down from heaven. Boy, your Bible is real, man. There's enough power above your head to wipe America out in 12 hours by the clock. God is angry. And America can't fight him. She's a punk in comparison to the power that is already here. Now, you may say, Farrakhan, you're losing it, you're losing it. But before you can call me crazy, you're going to see these planes over the major cities of America. They have been seen in Mexico, in South America. The president of Brazil said he's no longer going to hide it from the people. Jimmy Carter saw it before he became president and said when he became president, he would make it known when he became president, he shut his mouth. But it's up there. It's a half a mile by half a mile. America can't deal with it. It flies at terrific speed. The God is so powerful. He said, I will spend all my arrows on America. You need to ask him, how many arrows do you have? And he said, all of what is in the heavens and the earth, I can use it against you. You need air, I'll use wind. You need earth, I'll turn the earth against you. You need water, I'll turn the water against you. I'll drive you crazy with gnats, with bees, with hornets. He drove people at the, at the World Series out of the stadium with grasshoppers. All the plagues that came to Pharaoh, you will see them all on America. You don't have long to play. You better make up your minds. The time is running. The blood of a lamb should be on your gateposts, meaning that the life of the righteous should be inside that house. It's time for you to clean up, and it's time for you to repent of all the crap that we're doing that you know you're doing. Clean it up and show God that you are worthy for the death angel to pass over your house. Thank you for listening and may Allah bless you as I greet you in peace. Let's give it up for the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Come on, Baltimore. Show your love. Show your love.